In this section, we're going to discuss conservation of momentum and learn how to apply it to solve problems. Okay, so remember, the situation we're thinking of is something like this, where you have particles 1 and 2. The two particles uh, exert a force on one another, the force of particle 2 on 1 and the force of particle 1 on 2. Those two particles may also feel external uh, forces, force all the forces uh, on particle 2 from the external uh, world, and all the forces on particle 1 from the external world. We can write the system's total momentum vector as capital P, and so capital P dot vector is going to be the sum of the time derivatives of the two particles' uh, momenta. The change in the particle's momenta is given by the second line here, so this is the change in particle 1's momentum, so that's all the forces on particle 1. And then the change in particle 2's momentum is given by this line here. Remember that according to Newton's third law, the force of particle 1 on particle 2 has to be equal and opposite to the force of particle 2 on 1. And so when we calculate the total system's momentum vector, uh, the time derivative of that momentum vector turns out just to be equal to the sum of the external forces. As a consequence, if the external forces on our system are zero, then the change in the system's momentum is zero. In other words, the sum over all particles alpha, their momentum vectors, mass of particle alpha times the velocity vector alpha, that sum has to remain a constant for all time. So the book discusses a specific example of this. Imagine that you have two particles, particle one and particle two, with initial velocity vectors v1 and v2, and after some time those two particles crash into one another and that they stick. So they stick together somehow, and the final velocity vector for the combination of the two particles is vector v. Well, we know that the initial momentum for the system, pn, has to be exactly equal to the final momentum for the system, p final. And so the initial velocity, the initial momentum we can see here is m1 times v1 vector plus m2 times v2 vector, that has to be exactly equal to m1 times v vector plus m2 times v vector, which can be rewritten as the sum of the two masses, m1, m2 times v vector. That's the total system momentum, and that must remain a constant throughout uh, the entire history of the system. If we set uh, the left and the right hand sides equal to here, we find that we can solve for the final velocity vector, v vector, uh, in this final expression down here. So v vector is equal to particle 1's initial momentum plus particle 2's initial momentum divided through by the total mass of the system. So this gives us a way to solve for the dynamics of the system without having to know all that much about the system. So for example, we don't have to know anything about conservation of energy. All we need to know is that we're following the momentum of the entire system and that there are no, no external forces. Let's consider a, a specific case of this general problem. Let's imagine we have two particles, particle 1 and 2, uh, with initial velocity vectors shown like this. So in this case, we have particle 1's initial velocity, v1, uh, pointing along the positive x direction, and uh, particle 2, 2's velocity, v2, points along the negative y direction. For simplicity, let's assume that mass 1 is equal to mass 2, so the two masses are equal together. And let's imagine they crash into each other, and what we're interested in knowing is, What's the final velocity vector, in this case, uh, v vector? We can write the velocities of the two particles, the initial values, as uh, v1 vector times the scalar v1 times x hat. And then, of course, v2 vector is v2, the scalar, times uh, minus y hat. Using conservation of momentum, we can write this equation. Here's the initial momentum of the system. Here's the final momentum of the system. And these two things have to be equal to one another. The quality has to hold for the x and y components separately. And so this equation up here, showing the equality of momentum, is actually two different equations, one for each component. So for example, along the x direction, the only uh, initial uh, momentum is m1 v1 as a scalar. So that has to be equal to uh, the final momentum for the system along the x direction, which is the sum of masses times vx, the x component of the final velocity vector. And so we can solve for the x component of the final velocity vector like this. Same holds for the y component of the momentum, and so we can solve for, and we can compare the initial uh, momentum vector to the system along the y direction to the final, and what we find is the y component of the final velocity vector is given by this expression here. So it's uh, m2 over the sum of masses 
times the initial velocity uh, of particle two along the y direction. So the x and y components for the final velocity vector are shown here. If we now incorporate the assumption that m1 and m2 are equal to one another, we find that m1 over m1 plus m2, that's just one half, same for this expression. And so the x and y components uh, for the final velocity vector are shown here. And so we can write the system's final velocity vector in this way. We can see that the x component of the final velocity vector is just one half v1, and the y component of the velocity vector uh, is just one half v2. Just as an example of one simplification that might uh, be applicable to certain systems, if we have a system in which the momentum, uh, the initial momentum of particle one is much, much greater than the initial momentum of particle two, uh, then we can write an expression for the final velocity vector as this. So now the final velocity vector is really just the initial uh, momentum of particle one divided by the total mass. Now this condition that the initial momentum of particle one is much, much greater than the initial momentum of particle two, that can be true if, for example, uh, the initial velocity of particle two, v2 vector is zero, if the initial uh, mass, the mass of particle two, m2, is much, much smaller than m1, there's lots of ways for this condition to be satisfied. There are other useful simplifications we can apply. Let's imagine we have two particles, particles one and two again, with initial velocity vectors, v1 and v2 vectors. Um, and in this case, we're just thinking about the external forces in the system. Now those external forces, they don't have to be zero in order for us to uh, apply a conservation of momentum ar uh, argument. In fact, those external forces might be non-zero, in which case the final momentum for the entire system will be approximately equal to the initial momentum plus a small change in the total momentum of the system. In this case, it's going to be the sum of all external forces times some short time delta t. And so if the interaction between particles one and two occurs over a short time delta t, then we can approximate the change in momentum uh, as using this expression. And in this case, we're using what's called the impulse approximation. So the impulse, uh, F external times delta t, that's a small correction to the conservation of momentum argument. A good example of a system in which you could apply the impulse approximation might be the collision between two satellites. This is an animation of a real collision that took place between two satellites back in 2009. You can approximate the dynamic of the system using just the momenta of the two satellites plus the influence of the external force applied over a very short time delta t, the time of interaction for the two satellites. In this case, of course, the external force is the Earth's gravity.